Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Harrington Griffin. I'm the CEO of Trusted Land, and welcome to the virtual conference by Trusted Land. I'm just going to check that all uh, equipment is working all right and share my screen with you so we can get started. We've started a little bit early today because we've got a lot of content to get through. So uh, we're going to jump straight in. If, you, if it's your first time to Remo and you want to enlarge the screen that I've got in front of you, there's four little arrows on the top or right hand side. You can do that and it will make my face disappear so you can focus on the content. Um, for those who don't know Trusted Land, we are here to champion the real ones. Our job is to recognize, celebrate and to match successful real developers and real professionals of the SME developer space. Ships with uh, opportunities to gain knowledge and new contacts through events like this, like you're here at today. Um, if you're looking for more projects or sites, please do have a chat with our team. Or if you simply want to be recognized for the successes of your team, please do let us know and we'll tell you a bit more about what we do. Um, if it's your first time to Remo, welcome. This is quite a unique platform. We're in presentation mode at the moment. What you would have seen beforehand is networking mode. I'm going to have another break coming up very, very shortly. I'm going to dive straight into the content. If you do have any technical issues today, you can alert us in the chat on the right hand side or you can go to the queue uh, participants and find Juliana. She is our community manager and for today, our technical wizard as well. So do go and speak to her if you have any issues with sound, cameras, whatever else during the session. I do want to give a quick shout out. I forgot to write this down earlier. I want to give a shout out to my Land Aid Steptober Challenge team, which is uh, I'm going to take all the credit for the name. It's called Steptober and Sons. I'm the captain of the team. I've put four excellent walkers into play who are currently second on the leaderboard. If Damien Wilde from the EG, Dominic Grace from Savills, Nick McIntyre from Ridgepoint Homes, or James Tregoning from London Green ask you to sponsor Steps Tober and Sons, that is my team. Please support Land Aid Challenge. They're currently second, uh, led by um, only led by the Land Aid CEO team. So. We're hoping we can get 50,000 steps racked up by the weekend to uh, to beat them. But please look out for that. In terms of the agenda today, we are going to run through a quick fireside chat, as we've labeled it, with Nick Cuff from Pocket Living. They've produced some very, very interesting research on the planning results of small sites, which I think you guys would be very, very interested to hear more about. So we're going to touch on that briefly before our first feature with Robert Davis, MBE. Robert is, uh, for those who know him, was a former chairman of Westminster Planning Committee, was there for 17 years, a record which is held in the uh, in planning committees around the country. And Duncan Gunn, our esteemed award winner from Gunn Associates, is going to be taking through a little bit of a Q&A session. We'll then have a networking break at about 4.45, for about 15 minutes. Do use Remo for its full potential, jump around the table, say hello to people, organize a chat on a private table. This is the difference you will get with Remo versus Zoom versus Teams or other, other platforms. Use it to its full potential. You've turned here, turned up here. You've invested the time to be here. Make the most of it. We'll then go on to our main panel session, which will be hosted by Richard Pudera from Inspired Equity, which will cover off how to source PD opportunities within the rush that's going to happen over the next, uh, say, 12 to 18 months to make sure you achieve a healthy margin as well. So we've got a great panel session lined up for you. Looking forward to covering that off. So to jump straight into our trusted wins, this is the part of the session that we read out some of the wins and results from some of our members that we want to share with you, that they wanted us to share with you as well. So I'll speed through these very, very quickly. Uh, Pegasus Group have, a, have been approved by West Suffolk Council for residential development of 499 new homes in Haverhill. Well done to them. Uh, Christopher Adelaide Architecture was named Architect of the Month by Reba London. That is excellent work, excellent result. Planning Insight have had consent for three large contemporary banners on a for one of their clients in Whitechapel. We have a double trusted win, which is uh, I think uh, one of the only the second we've had so far for planning consultants DRK Planning and architecture firm. Formed architecture, who you would have seen with Tom Bloxham last month, led by Tina Patel, have been granted planning permission to take an empty 35 bed care home and turn it into a 30 unit apartment scheme in Suffolk. Well done to them. Mode Transport have uh, been announced as the 20, in 26th position for transport planning, uh, according to the Charter Institution of Highways and Transportation, an important guide 
um, in their 2020 directory. So congratulations to them. We also have the Devon team of Bell Cornwall, who have been given permission for their client Clinton Devon Estates on two agricultural buildings that we changed over to five self-contained homes. We also have um, Sanmi, who from Rehoboth, it, Rehoboth it Property International, I do all struggle with that, sorry Sanmi, um, they've just acquired a new building in Camden, which they're going to reconvert into uh, housing. If you don't follow Sanmi on social media, go and follow them. The content they produce is fantastic and they're just beginning uh, a daily win, it seems at the moment. For the team at uh, Thomas Alexander, they had a great result with their planning committee in Croydon for a nine unit scheme um, that was of a, an existing bungalow scheme. And I think we have one more, which is this bit off my sheet. So apologies if I don't cover you off, if you're on that list, uh, that is our collection for today. As I said, we are flying through the content. I do want to share one of our own big wins, and this is the trusted land. For those who would have seen in various WhatsApp forums and various promotions on social media, we have given ourselves a birthday present. Our third birthday was on the 21st of September. We gave ourselves a brand upgrade. So you see the new Trusted Land logo, uh, the new icon, and of course, the new website to go with it. The important part, I think, of this to share is that there is now a lot more information that you can gather around the members we have in there that will help you if you're looking for partners, if you're looking for a developer, for an agent to work with, you can understand exactly what they're about a lot quicker and a lot simpler. Um, there's a video on LinkedIn that I did share that talks a little bit around the branding and the icon uh, that gets into the story of why, which if you're interested, go and check it out, go into sort of uh, a bit more detail, but we'll move swiftly on. But I just wanted to share our own trusted win after many months of, uh, of development. We're very pleased what we've, uh, we've landed with. Um, Real developer, for those who are avid readers of the States Gazette, you would have seen a fair bit of promotion over the last few weeks. We have now got four weeks to go till we finish allocating the placements for Real Developer 2021. Uh, up on the screen in front of you is some of the firms who have signed up and confirmed placements for 21. We're very, very pleased to have them on board. And we're also very, very pleased to have the arrival of Urban Splash as a new entrant as they move into the Southeast uh, for some of their projects for 2021 as well. The criteria is up on the screen. If you qualify, if you know somebody who qualifies as a developer, please do ask them to get in touch. This is a opportunity to recognize SME development talent, those that are active, that have track record and have the ability to get great deals done. So please do uh, check them out. Juliana will post in the links on the, uh, in the chat, the link to register if you haven't registered already. Take you two seconds if you are a developer. Uh, moving swiftly on, we have got uh, well, one of the things we are very proud of for our existing 2020 developers is we have produced a very interesting bit of collateral called the Q4 land requirements. And this is a quarterly summary of the land requirements of 28 of our existing real developers. So we've consolidated their top build type requirement, their locations, the pound per square foot, and importantly, some of the details around their funding position. Just to give you kind of an idea of who features in there of the 28 firms, they're on average about 12 years old. They've produced over the last five years, 2,568 units between them. And in terms of what they claim is available as proof of funds, we're in the region of about 133 million of those 28 firms. So if you want to work with them, if you're an agent, an established sourcer, and you want to get hold of that list, Juliana will post the link in there to, to go and redeem. So just before we get on to our first feature, we invite Nick Cuff to come up. Just the date for your diary is the second to last session of 2020 is the 4th of November, our new time of 4 p.m. till 5.30 p.m. And we will have one single session with one of our guest speakers. And really what we're looking at is what is happening in the space of receivership around development receivership. So how to move in and work on those opportunities if that's part of your strategy. And also I think it's just worth looking at some of the unfortunate sides of the post COVID world, which is why are some sites ending up in receivership? as a good sort of reminder for all of us in terms of the fundamentals beyond profit, beyond getting the right build team that make a site work uh, fundamentally. So we look forward to that session on the 4th of November. It'll be an important one. So I think that brings us to the point where I get to invite Nick Cuff to come up and join me on stage. I will stop sharing my screen. Juliana, if you can help me out. So the reason we're having this, this very brief session today is just to 
go through a couple of the bits of research that have been released by uh, Pocket Living and Litchfield very recently. Um, you may have seen some of the coverage. If not, I really do encourage you to go check it out. Uh, it's a very important piece. So Nick and I are going to whiz through some of the background to it just to give you a little bit of a teaser as to what they uncovered. So Nick, thank you very much for joining me. Let's jump straight in. So this research you produced, why did you do it and what did it show you? Well, thank you, Alex, and uh, great to be here again. So the why was partly because we're at a very, very important time for SME developers, I think. There's a recognition in government that there is a need to do some quite radical planning reforms for the system. And there was a there was a view that I was finding with others who were talking to civil servants around planning reform that SME developers were a not very significant part of the market anymore. And there was a, a theory that actually the focus needs to be on, on larger, larger developments. And what's interesting is if you look at the context that we, we work within and go back 30, 40 years to the, well, not even 30, 40 years, to the 1980s, 40% um, of housing in this country was delivered by independents. But today it's one in 10 which tells you that actually SMEs were, were much more influential uh, some years ago. And so why have we lost that kind of influence? Why is it that in the last um, 10 years in London, there's been a 50% drop, for example, in small developers? And doing some digging around this, there was lots of theories, but no one actually had have looked at the data or looked, found data to actually substantiate why all these SMEs had disappeared. So. The research that we conducted, essentially, we brought in a planning consultancy called Litchfield, who many of you will know, very, very established organization. And we took a deep dive into the only data set that exists for small sites, which is the London planning data set um, of sites of over 10 homes, but under 100 homes, 150 homes, and uh, looked at the journey of those sites to find out what is going on. So that's, that's where it came from, Alex. And there is a couple of highlights. We've seen, we've seen Robert Jenrick retweet those this week as, or last week as well. Um, good timing, considering we are uh, due to meet him next week as well with yourself and a few other real developers. What was the kind of highlights that came out of it? And then, and then I think we've got to finish off with, you know, the all recommendations, what you think yeah. can change, and what, importantly, what we can do about it. Yeah, I mean, I encourage you all to have a look at it. Um, it's on the Litchfield's website. But the, the, the big finding was that dispute within the, the system for small developers is systemic. And, and and what we're talking about here is, is, is not under 10 homes, where there's still a rich micro environment, but, but uh, developers trying to deliver over 10 homes, but under 100, 150. So it's quite a specific part. And, and what's happening is that we have a one size fits all system um, in this country for all developers, large or small, and a policy, um, policy requirement, which requires in the main for them all to deliver three forms of tenure and a range of dwelling mixes on sites. And essentially on small sites, developers can't do that. And so they were getting nulled up in the system. The research found that on average, it takes 60 weeks to get a planning permission as a small site, five times the statutory limit. And that two third, uh, sorry, a quarter of the sites that we locked out at random, so completely randomized from the sample, had taken two or three attempts just to get planning. And the number one issue was affordable housing. Um, small sites can deliver affordable housing, by the way, but they're not meeting the policy target. So they're going through viability and it's leading to lots and lots of disputes. So we found that the system itself is just too complicated. And I think that perhaps explains partly why a lot of developers have said, actually, we don't want to go, in, go into this anymore or go, for, go to a scale beyond a certain level because the uncertainty and the ambiguity in the system by not being able to meet all the requirements uh, means that there's too much risk. So I'm just gonna give a call to action to everyone watching here, especially if you're on the developer side. And I think it's important we consider the, you know, the architects and the planning cons uh, consultants view as well. Can you just, if you are, if you have access to the chat now, can you just put your a yes or your name or whatever else, just very quickly, if you'd be interested in dropping a submission back to uh, MHCLG, uh, Pocket Living have us, uh, essentially agreed to help us submit uh, some comments from the SME scene. So if you feel that you want to get your point across, even if it's just to get some feedback, 
to um, take part in a quick poll that will consolidate some results that we can then pass back to government, please do take a note now. We want to get a feel. If we're going to do this, we want to see what the appetite is as well. And just while people are doing that, Nick, what is the, the kind of recommendations you come up with um, before we jump on to our, our next feature? Well, there are quite a few, and I think it's great. We, we, I think as a sector, we need to step up. The, the, there isn't really a representative organisation for SME developers out there. There's the HBF, there's the Federation of Master Builders, but we do need, as a sector, with the government listening to us, as you say, Generix looks at the research, he thinks it's interesting, to, to make our voices count. Now, we said that small sites should have their own classification, and um, what I mean by small, I mean 10 to over 100, perhaps, that kind of section. So a different threshold, not big, big sites, but that's threshold. And there should be a fast track if small site developers can deliver a certain number of affordable homes on site. So we're saying if you can deliver as a developer 40 percent uh, intermediate homes on a small site, you should have a fast track through planning, no viability. You meet the policy threshold. You, uh, you get certainty, which will allow you to price your land better and also to price your consents better. And we've also said very quickly, permission in principle is an idea that the government is looking at in the white paper. Well, it needs to be with teeth. At the moment, no developer buys a site without the principle of, their, those, um, of a residential scheme or a mixed use scheme being in place. You just wouldn't do it. So that's not the answer. What you need, though, is certainty about the height, the number of homes and perhaps the tenure you have those things in place, we'll have a lot more confident to invest in land and to see a lot more SME developers coming in and building the sector and growing the capacity of the sector. So there's lots in there. Um, look at it. But I think there's a real opportunity here for us as a sector to speak up and get something which is meaningful to grow our entire ecosystem, as you like to call it, Alex. I think it's right. It is an ecosystem to something more meaningful than it is at the moment. Wonderful. Nick, thank you very much. I can see there's a flood of yeses coming through in the chat as well. So there obviously is a lot of appetite to go and put a response back to government and we will start to formulate something as well. So Nick, I know that was what we were looking for. We want to try and get some support at the right time. Um, thank you very much for sharing. Keep up the amazing work and keep on the flag for the SMEs as well. So we appreciate thank it. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Good. Mate. Good. Giovanna, if you want to help me with uh, the next guest as well, we're now going to move straight into our first uh, feature for this today. Um, I was very fortunate to meet uh, Robert Davis in uh, July of this year and sit down and talk a little bit about his work. I did happen to, just two days after meeting him, manage to pick up a podcast between Susan Freeman and Robert, uh, which really went into a lot of the detail around the amazing work that he has done. And we felt with his uh, activity, with his experience, that we wanted to invite one of our award-winning uh, members and architects, Duncan Gunn, to come and spend some time and understand a little bit more about Robert's work and I think you know one of the things that, from my perspective as an ex-developer, is really understand what happens within uh, planning councils and committees when they're reviewing developers' work, and hopefully end up with some advice for the SME developers that are taking part in sites in Greater London and beyond in terms of how to make sure they put a strong applications forward and they present themselves in the right way. So, Robert, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be um, here. That's a great background as well, by the way. It's very well presented. Mm -hmm. I think the difference is, though, you can touch your background, whereas Duncan, I think, uh, would it would some of those books may, may not fall off the shelf if you rock them too much. Really, you cynic, Alex. I'll leave you guys to okay. it. Thank you very much. I'll catch you guys at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Alex, and welcome, Robert. Um, it's it's a great pleasure to speak to you for the next uh, twenty minutes. I shall do as little talking as possible because it will be of le far less value to everybody than than what you're going to. To say, but essentially, um, the members here of Trusted Land and the people who are attending this conference, um, as you know, uh, all of us uh, struggle at some point to understand the planning process, but also when um, applications go through to committees, how best to get um, their developments through committees. And and so, if you don't mind me saying, um, I'm asking to start with. I'd like to understand from you what you think in your experience has have been the, the com most common mistakes from developments being put forward to committee, but also making it a bit more positive. How can people not make those mistakes? Well, first of all, can I say um, a lot of applicants do it perfectly, but there are surprisingly a number who make a lot of mistakes. And often it's because they don't not used to working in a particular 
a, a borough or city. Um, and that's often where they, they come a cropper. If they've worked, for example, outside London a lot, and then they have to deal with a London borough, often they don't realise it's often a different uh, premises to work with and a different uh, their priorities. Um, the first thing I would always say is where possible, they should always make a pre-application consultation. They should really, really um, consult widely before making their application. And in particular, they should seek advice from the officers. And where the councils have the avail availability of signing up to a planning performance agreement, yes, there's a fee to be paid, but it's usually worth it. You can actually get that initial advice from officers, put forward your proposal and see what the officers are saying at an early stage. Because if you are going to spend a lot of money developing your application and you've just hitting the wrong buttons, it is best to know at the beginning, even if it costs you by having to pay for that application, uh, a pre-application uh, fee. The other thing you must, must remember is a lot of applicants don't actually submit the right documents. How many times applicants either submit insufficient documents, the wrong documents, or even don't pay a fee? And they then get all worked up as why their application has been dealt with after three or four weeks. Uh, when they used to complain to me, I would look into it and find out that they actually hadn't paid the fee or they hadn't submitted the documents they were required to do so. So it's going to be a methodical job. You've got to put all the documents together and pay that fee. You also need to check the policy. And every borough has a different plot plan. You have to check the plan. And to make things even more complicated, you have now neighborhood planning. And so in some areas, not all, some areas you will have a neighborhood plan, which often will be different to the main plan. It's supposed to be in conformity, but often will have different niceties. So you have to understand what is the planning policies are locally. And it's not just broad planning policies, it's actually guidelines such as windows, roof extensions. Each council will often have detailed guidelines as how to make an application, what they will see as acceptable, for, for example, for, for, for an extension for, for, for a window. So I think that's important. And finally, on, on answering this question, be prepared for the three draw principle. I always accepted that there were a clever applicant had three draws. The top drawer is that really outrageous application that if he actually got through, he would be delighted with the 30 story um, building. But when the council turned around to him and said, no way, you've already got in that second drawer, the, the 25 story building, which you know is probably a bit more acceptable and you bring that out straight away. But even then the council will try and push you back. So you have that third drawer when you have the one you don't really want, but you know will be acceptable, the 20 story building. And you know that that's what the officer will think they have actually knocked, knocked you down a third and will actually be helpful. So uh, that's the reality of playing the game. It's like playing poker. You have to actually be prepared to compromise. And I think sometimes applicants don't. And there's, I remember the very famous case that I had to deal with where a very renowned architect, uh, when I told him I didn't like his uh, proposal, he smashed the, uh, uh, the model in front of me uh, into pieces and walked out the room. I don't think you should do that. It doesn't help the application. Uh, at which point you said that's better. Well, at the end of the day, uh, we had a compromise. He, his client had to push him into uh, finding a compromise. Yes. And so what you're really saying there is that, as in a lot of life, it's, it's certainly something um, I, I adhere to, is, is get the preparation right. So do your research on an area. And it obviously um, gives a lot of weight, I see, to developers specialising in areas because then they know the policies. And they also know, I imagine it's very importantly, when policies change because they're in the loop on that. Um, yeah, if you work in a certain area, you've got to really engage with, 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 the, with the council and the politicians and follow what they're doing. If you know, When I was running planning in Westminster, there are a number of, of, of developers, uh, property owners, who concentrate and specialise in Westminster. Mm -hmm. And they would engage with us. They, they would hear what was happening. We would often consult with them when we were changing our policies. And, and we would often meet them in, in the social surrounds. Uh, uh, we have, in, in, certainly in Westminster, the Westminster Property Association. Uh, and that is an association of many uh, property owners. And we would meet socially at, at, at many functions. They would host uh, drinks, parties, events, uh, and you learn what was going on and you understand what was going on behind the change in policies and how the council regarded applications. 
Yeah. So really, you know, it's preparation, but it's also taking the the local planning authority seriously. So reading their documents, understanding what the changes are, understanding, as you say, the validation requirements and and not missing any of them and being surprised that your application is sitting there waiting. And and getting, um, as you say, the, the three drawers re ready to go. So it's preparation, preparation, preparation by the sound of it. Exactly. Um, Good. Well, that, well that, that, that's incredible. And um, I mean, so going on then, so because that's making an application and that may go through delegated powers or it may go through committee. Um, what, in, in terms of applications that go forward to committee for whatever reason, what do you find make them likely to be more successful. Now, of course, you know, I caveat it by the office that presumably has already recommended approval or refusal or, or some, something else on, on the development. But how do you see that committees look favourably? Um, do, they, do they like pre-consultation um, with, with you know, borough councillors and so on? I think it's absolutely crucial to do your pre-application engagement. Um, and there are various people you have to engage with. Yes, first of all, the ward councillors. Yeah. It is absolutely crucial to get the ward councillors on side. If you don't get them on side, in many authorities, and they're against you, they will be very influential, influencing their, their colleagues and friends on the committee uh, not to support your application. So it's absolutely essential to explain, to take them on a site visit, uh, and often to use a consultant to, to, to get that access if you don't have the access yourself. There's also senior councillors, like the head of planning, the senior planning councillors, uh, and, and get to them, have range for meetings for them. Of course, if it's a smaller site, that's much more difficult. And a lot of councils now have protocols on how to get access to the senior councillors. But it is worth trying uh, and to try and put your case across. That's absolutely essential. But what is becoming more and more important is community engagement. And the councils are now expecting you to have consulted with the local residents the residents associations and in particular in certain areas where you have very active and very self-important chairman of the residents association who can make or break an application and, and certainly in Westminster from my experience there are a number we have what is called amenity societies they're large area-wide residents associations and some of those chairmen are very powerful they influence the councillors uh, because the councillors are petrified of them because of, they want to get re-elected and they can again make or break so you have to get them on board at an early stage and if they feel they're being part of the consultation process they're more likely to support you the one where it comes cold to them and they're, they're unhappy just because often because they they felt they've been ignored not because they don't like your application and now of course you've got neighborhood forums again they're not everywhere but they become equally important as a meeting to societies um and so it is important um to 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 work with people and often if you are getting a an adverse response is to try and explain your views now i want to give you a, a good example i'm not going to name names but there was an application in, in mayfair uh, which was extremely contra controversial and there are over 150 letters from local residents objecting seriously to this application the applicant uh, the, 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 the chairman of the company, who uh, it was a small, relatively small company, he individually knocked on doors and got access to about 70 to 80 percent of these people. And he invited himself in, sat down and tried to explain what he was trying to do, gave them assurances about the development. And about a hundred of those actually wrote in saying, I've now heard from the applicant. I've met him. I'm reassured. I'm withdrawing my, my, my objection. And then when we saw that, and there were a few who wouldn't withdraw, and they never really not going to have, make everyone happy, we realized a long, a, a big attempt had been made to address the concerns, and that application was granted. And, and I, I always say, well done to that guy who, who put the hard work in. It's not easy doing that. He did it, and as a result, he got his application through. And again, we go back again, don't we, to that tenet of preparation and taking the application seriously. And you would think, of course, with even a, a, a smaller, a smaller application of, let's say, nine residential units and so on, there still should be a good amount of that research and talking to board councillors and talking to residents. Because for those people who live next door to that, a nine flat, 
for instance, residential block is significant. You, you must also remember that a lot of the objectors don't actually really understand planning law. Yeah. And so they'll often the objections will be nothing to do with planning. It'll be about the disruption caused by the works themselves. And that relatively easy. A, a you can't just you can't have no disruption. You can't, you know, you can't crack and make an omelet without cracking an egg. But on the other hand, you can go a long way to reassure the neighbors how you will minimize uh, the disturbance. And by providing a personal telephone number so if there is a noise or disturbance, then you can, they can contact you. They're more likely to be reassured and re re remove their objection than, than someone who, you know, uh, having for the, to go to a committee and for the committee to say, well, actually, this is not really planning grounds. You don't want it to get that far. So often, uh, so many times, the objectors, the very fierce objectors, are not objecting on planning grounds, but on the on, on the fact that it's going to be upsetting, disturbing, the noise and disturbance, uh, etc. And and you know, and having building works and, and roads closed and, and uh, materials arrive at early in the morning, you have to address that and be reasonable and and respect that people are living or working next door. Yes, absolutely. And it must be said also in these times of social distancing, there are methods of doing this type of communication virtually in terms of either setting up community websites, um, as you say, having on hand email addresses, dedicated email boxes for residents to, to, to write to and get information. Can, can, I, can I just add that when I was, it, it, I was a solicitor, a, a property solicitor, when I was in practice, our office was opposite a major development site. And for two and a half years, we had that major development uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the noise. But what the applicants, the, the owners of the site did is they distributed a weekly newsletter. By, it was a hard copy at Twardo every Friday afternoon. And in it, it not only updated us what was going on behind the hoardings, but it told us what was going to happen next week. So next Tuesday, between three and five, we were getting a delivery. On the Friday morning, we were going to get a crane arrive. So we knew and we could plan the week ahead to actually know that we should be uh, not have a, a meeting that afternoon or, 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 or not try and do something that needs quiet uh, and we can work around that and that helped us a lot uh, okay residential again if you live next to a site and you know that on thursday afternoon between uh, 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 eight in the morning and ten you that's when you go shopping and it can yeah. avoid the noise so that type of consultation is crucial yeah absolutely thank you that's very useful advice um one of our delegates has, has asked a question about um, the, uh, the politics of the committee um, and for instance there is often a split politically in the committee members understandably um, um, and is, is there any advice that you can give our delegates in terms of how to is there a way of dealing with that split when going to committee where you have a, a, a thought that perhaps the committee is going to go you know majority on always majority on one side minority vote on the other side. Is there any way of crossing that divide as an applicant? That is a, a big issue with planning committees. Uh, and often when um, affordable housing is involved, it does become party political. There are some uh, uh, minority party members who are sensible and are ones who look at the planning issues. But there are one or two who are purely political and that's very difficult but you have to access them if you can beforehand and you have to try and, and, and do the consultation we talked about it is an inevitable problem and uh that's why you have to get uh, you have to do a lot of hard work beforehand but you wouldn't suggest i assume playing the same let's call it the political game that councillors inevitably in the democratic process have to play as an applicant you should play it pretty straight yeah, yes, you shouldn't play the political game at all. No, that would make things worse. Yeah. But I think you need to work with them and respect their different views. You have to, when you get to know who's on the committee, they usually publish it a week or two beforehand. You can ascertain, and if you do your research, whether you're going to get a political opposition or someone who's sensible. As that happens at Westminster, one of the most um, politically active members of the minority party when it came to planning on planning committee was very sensible and really played the planning line um but you know any others who maybe didn't understand planning as well as others did often just played the political line yeah yeah that's that's good thank you and oh i think i'm seeing alex's picture pop up but quickly if we have any time how, how do you see the future of planning committees um there is 
great planning reform at the moment. When this development might change, uh, we've discussed this offline, as to whether the, the political vote is what we're being told for that. But do you see the same future for the democratic process of planning? No, I don't. I think it's going to change a lot. Uh, I think that the key is uh, a few years ago. I think it was the early days of the Cameron government. They were talking about getting rid of planning committees and devolving planning powers to the cabinet member for planning. So one person would make the decision very much like happens with the mayor of London. He makes the single decision or delegates it to his planning deputy. Um, and and the, one of the reasons is that a lot of people on planning committees have the foggiest idea what planning is all about, don't understand about a viability, uh, how the, the commercial side of development, and it can be very frustrating for when you're getting, and, and they can be party political. So that is, that is often an option. But I think the way the government is currently thinking is, yes, they are. That's why they're introducing uh, these growth areas, renewal areas, where the planning will be, uh, uh, won't have to go to committee. Uh, and there'll be a lot more permitted development rights. So yes, things are changing. Yeah, OK, Robert, thank you very much. I'm sure Alex will come in here. Duncan, Robert, uh, sorry to, uh, to jump in and cut you off there as well. I feel like this conversation we could get a lot of value from by carrying on as well. And, maybe deserves an entire session by itself. We just wanted to get a bit yeah. of a snapshot. And I think, Robert, one of the criminal uh, offences here from us is not to give you more time to talk about your, your amazing work in, in the various spaces and the art space as well. We've, we've spoken about a few mutual contacts. Um, just one quick question from me, if I can. Um, I did post about this on LinkedIn during the week, and you and I spoke about it when we met the first time. Duncan and myself had the, the opportunity to go and sit uh, with John Burns, the founder of Derwent, um, PLC, who um, you have, I uh, understand, worked with in the past as well. And one of the pieces of advice that he gave to Duncan and myself in terms of what he feels was one of the fundamentals of recognizing a good, real developer was just showing respect to parties, no matter who they were, whether it was someone at the front desk, whether it was someone they were, who was making the decision. What for you is kind of a, a key word that you feel uh, resonates with you as a, when you see a real developer, when you meet a developer, you think, they're doing it the right way. What is kind of a what's a summary of, of what you think a real developer is? They're, they're honest and, and and responsible. I think you know there are a lot of um, and they're looking at, at really look to improve the area as well as have a good development for themselves. You know the council uh, when I was running Westminster's planning, uh, we when there were sort of big developers, a big property owners who had large interests in the city. Uh, and therefore we're not interested in just making a quick buck and moving on to the next site actually interested in the area actually contributed towards the public realm actually wanted to work with us because they cared about the area as much as making the profits for their company which they are perfectly entitled to do they're the people we listened to and worked with better than someone who quite clearly came in was on a, wanted to make a quick uh, development and, and make some money and then disappear and they don't care what left, they left behind it's those developers who really show an interest in the area and that, for example, contributing to public realm is just an example, contributing to the area, working with the residents, supporting them at long term. That's what makes them someone we will actually listen to because they'll be something. I mean, we, we were lucky in Westminster. We had the biggest, we had the biggest estates, the landed estates, uh, the Crown Estate, uh, Grosvenor Estate, the Walden. And they have a long term interest. They're going to be there longer than I was going to be there. I've, I've done 36 years there. They're there for 100 of years. Uh, and and we, they, they cared about the area as much as we did. Uh, and therefore, we would often uh, support them, but we wouldn't support someone who was quite clearly, uh, suddenly they made some profit, they didn't care what they left behind. Wonderful. That is great advice and great comment. And Duncan, great questions as well. So thank you both for spending the time to prepare for today's session and spend some time with us as well. Um, can I advise anybody who wants to learn more about um, Robert's background and amazing uh, stint with the Westminster Council and previous to go and check out Property Sheet Podcast with Susan Freeman. I think it was November, Robert, that you and um, Susan sat down. No, it was earlier. It was, it was in the summer. It was in about July. July. Go and check it out. Well worth listening to. No, no. Number 13. Pardon? Lucky for some. I think it was number 13 or, or 30 or something. Yeah. I learned a lot from it as well. So definitely go and check it out. We're going to jump into a break now. Robert and Duncan, thank you very much. We've got about 15 minutes. So we're back just after um, five o'clock, uh, about three minutes past, and we'll go into our main panel session. Remember, when we're out of presentation mode, you can jump around the tables, double click on them. You can go and uh, ask someone to have a quick catch up if you want to talk business with them as well. Use remote to its full potential. We'll see you back in about 15 minutes. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.